2024 is over. Let's dive in to 25. Happy Friday, friends. It is Friday, and it's hard to believe 2024 is done. It is in the history books, and that's the only way it will be updated at this point. So hopefully all of you had a wonderful 2025 and that, uh, you know, it's a Friday, so we should all be in a good mood. Now, there wasn't a ton going on this week. However, there was a lot of uh, some eh, Microsoft stuff that's worth talking about. However, a little bit shorter of a podcast than usual because, hey, the holiday was in the middle of the week for the new year. And so anyways, I hope all of you had a wonderful week. Let's dive in to the important stuff. In case, which uh, has been talked a lot about on this podcast because, hey, they effectively bought the rights, the molds, and everything else related to Microsoft's peripherals. And we're getting our first look at maybe a, a net new-ish sort of product, if you will. This is the Compact Ergonomic Keyboard. It'll be coming in early 2025. I think you can pre-order it now. It does feature a Microsoft uh, co-pilot key there that is hilariously, again, not really functional for enterprise customers, but for the consumers, there you go. You'll be able to go ahead and use that. $120 dues. So not exactly cheap, uh, but that's kind of what you got to expect here. Once like the Microsoft purse has been closed, right? They're not bankrolling this stuff. They got to make more money on the products each sold to keep doing this. So when you don't have Microsoft's backing, things are going to cost a little bit more than you might be typically expected to pay for a Microsoft product. Now, it's important to say this isn't really a Microsoft product. This is a Microsoft designed product that is now being built and manufactured by another company called InCase. And there you go. So in case you needed it, there you go. For what it's worth, I obviously have not used this particular product, but Microsoft's ergonomic mice and more specifically their keyboard had a legion of uh, fans. And so I suspect as long as this keeps that same style, they're going to be doing a okay with something like this. So uh, other interesting things, we got a, a, I believe this was a former employee at this point, but he shared a, a bunch of I, probably things I'm going to go with you probably shouldn't have, but it doesn't really matter. So remember dynamic wallpapers? This is what this was a thing that we expected to show up with, I think, Windows 11, and it never really did. There were leaks of like AI tilt shift stuff and other things going on, but these dynamic wallpapers never really materialized in any meaningful way. And it looks, it, as it turns out, there were more to them than what we know so far. So this individual posted on their own, uh, their own, I think it's Adobe page, but it's a, we'll just call it a blog for that. And and this is what they look like. So as you can see here, they are they're dynamic backgrounds at the end of the day, which is super interesting because Microsoft has, has shied a little bit away from this. But uh, anyways, he says a variety of dynamic animations and still images were explored from Microsoft's low cost devices, primarily targeted education users. This work was for part of Windows Creative Direction Team's effort to celebrate a new centered position for the Windows 11 start menu and taskbar design, obviously. The designs were crafted to be adaptable for light and dark modes, allowing for flexibility and in interpretation and execution. So here's another one. Um, I think it's important to keep in mind that these things are very fluid, and fluid like in a good way. Like they're, they're, they're very smooth. They look high quality, they look super good. So part of me wonders too, if like the actual execution of these things within the Windows shell, was it just quite up to the expectations that Microsoft really wanted to ship? If like there were genuinely like other problems there and per the author's own uh, messaging saying that they were designed for lower like education, uh, lower spec devices. This potentially could also indicate, hey, like, yeah, these things are great and cool and neat, but they add some overhead. And yeah, and these are by far renders, by the way. These do not appear to be like what it would look like. Yes, there is a start menu there, but this is all like, it, this is, that's a static start menu. This is not a screen recording in OBS on a desktop. It, at least I would be shocked if it is, because that is like a super smooth and high refresh. And just knowing how Windows works under the covers a little bit there. That sort of mechanism it would be, it would require a lot of CPU compute probably to get there. Now, somebody's going to say, but there's a lot of CPU compute out there. These new devices have tons of cores, and you're not wrong. But remember, this is initially targeted like education devices, lower end stuff. And so you're trying to keep performance of the things that matter most, like the browser and office applications and running this stuff in the background just adds enough. Now, you could also, it could just quite simply be like, hey, they ran out of time and they decided not to ship it. That is also a very viable and potentially option uh, that was just, you know, sort of the reality at the end of the day. So, yeah. Anyways, super cool look, though. It's unfortunate those things never shipped, but for whatever various reasons, they just never really made it. 
Uh, other things happening here in the very near future, CES is upon us, friends, which means you're going to see a smattering of blog posts and fancy images of new products that you can't buy and you probably don't even know the price of or the availability date, and they may never ship or materialize. But it is that time of the year in January where all these things get announced. We've already seen a bunch of monitors for like Samsung and LG. Now, I fully expect those to ship, but you'll see some crazy designs. It doesn't Razer every year to put out some creative concept that they don't intend to ship. It's just more of a, it's a marketing thing for one thing, but a, a design conception about what the future could be like. We'll see a lot of that stuff. I, I, what I hope we will see here in the near future, uh, we've already, I think it's Asus has a new miniature PC. I'm hoping we see more, not like a, a Mac mini, I guess, comparable, but on the Windows side with a Snapdragon chip. I'm hoping we're going to see more of those small form factors. Now that Asus, I believe it's Asus, uh, has this odd co-pilot button on it, by the way, which has to be like a branding thing. Microsoft says all, all co-pilot plus PCs have to have a co-pilot key in Asus. And they're like, we're not shipping the keyboard, so we'll slap it on the side. And so that's probably what they did. What I really do hope that we see in 2025 is more ARM stuff, but not necessarily from Qualcomm. I'm really hoping we see NVIDIA enter the race and maybe a couple others potentially join the fold. And then we really start to see a new SIP, uh, SIP new chip war take off between Intel, AMD, NVIDIA, Qualcomm, all fighting for uh, performance dominance on the Windows side. It would probably work out for well for everybody unless you are Intel, who's struggling in their own right. But anyways, I hope that that all comes in materialization. And we'll see here, not expecting all this stuff to be announced at CES, more of a 2025. And speaking of 2025, the other thing to keep in mind, this is the last year of Windows 10 support, unless you're willing to cough up the dollar dues. So I'll be curious to see, and we should all place our bets, what percentage of the desktop market share, and we'll say desktop, including Mac, will still be running Windows 10 by the end of October. I believe it's end of October is, or, it's, or in October when, October 25th, if I think correctly, when support ends. So at the end of October, Halloween, how many PCs are still going to be running Windows 10 potentially unsupported or are they all going to start paying Microsoft the $30 for that? On to the gaming news. There is more controller news hitting the wire. You might remember this, the Seabile. C C uh, it's a new controller. This was part of the leaks, the, the mega leaks. Was that 2023? Was it that long ago? Where Xbox, yeah, because they were trying to buy Activision, blah, blah, blah. And um, all that stuff accidentally got posted that wasn't redacted. And so this controller showed up and it never really shipped, right? We were expecting actually, I think it like in March or something like that uh, of 2024. And it never shipped. This was their direct to cloud sort of Game Pass uh, Stadia style controller integration or cloud gaming Stadia controller style thing. And it never shipped. According to Jez though, it's coming with the next generation console is the new plan. There's also some updated haptics. There's a patent that sort of reignited all this stuff. Uh, the round consoles or the refresh consoles for the Series X and S that we saw did not materialize obviously. So I would be doubtful that those things are coming. And so at the end of the day, this new controller is going to just be bumped to the release of the next generation or sometime during the next generation life cycle. And so that is really kind of about it. Um, it kind of has like the cow utter vibe here with the black handles, but I'm not, you know, the true cow utter vibe, I guess, would be the Nintendo 64 controller, but we're not going to go there. That's really all the gaming news. Like I said, really abridged week, but there are some questions in to Zahapa. Uh, let's just dive in here. George asks, he says, Hey Brad, what Surface hardware do you think we'll see this year? I think we'll see, well, we, I know of a couple things that are probably coming down the pipe, but here's the thing. So I think there's going to be some changes inside the Microsoft org yet again here, potentially even this month. And so when it comes to building these things like Microsoft, Microsoft is giving off the impressions internally that like they're really clamping down on expenditures and like non-viable things. And so before I say what I think will truly come, I think we'll see like the classic stuff like a laptop refresh, right? I'm really hoping we see um, some more innovative form factors, but I don't know if that's really going to happen. The, the long shot would be a Surface Studio refresh happening uh, in the fall. But again, very speculative at this point. So those are the sort of things that I, I don't think, I don't know if that Surface Studio is going to happen. It would be so great if they did with an ARM chip inside. Boom, that would be awesome. But uh, it was planned at one point, but I don't know if it's still planned. So we'll, we'll go with that. We will go with that. Matt Dina says, what were you assembling on Christmas Day? Looks complicated. Uh, it was actually Christmas eve and it was a chair yep just a chair 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 so um yeah we got that sean asks he says brad what did you think of the indiana jones campaign you said 
quoting yourself, you're going to play this over the holiday break. Is your holiday break over and have you completed Indiana Jones? Uh, so I have failed you, dear podcast listeners. I'm roughly halfway through Indiana Jones. I'm roughly halfway through. I will finish it. It's pretty good. So it's pretty good with a caveat. So my, my biggest complaint about Indiana Jones, and this showed up in some reviews and really just ex- kind of depends on where you fall on this stuff. Obviously, very story driven, very narrative driven, very cutscene driven. I think my biggest complaint about Indiana Jones and uh, what is an otherwise so far superb title is that the cutscenes are very heavy. Meaning, like sometimes, like hopefully it's not a spoiler, right? The, in the very first scene, it's like almost like the tutorial that you're going through. You have to use your whip to swing across a, a, a pit. And that's like, it, it turns into a cutscene. Like you don't actually swing all the way across if I remember correctly. And it's just very cutscene heavy. And so if you don't like cutscenes and you don't like watching that stuff, you're probably in for not for a great time. But otherwise, like so far, halfway through the game, is it's well done. And it's something that Xbox needed. It's not an FPS. Like, well, I guess it is FPS, but it's not a shooter. It's more of a mystery style game. Um, very story driven. I think it's good. I, I It deserves all the praise and the awards that it has received. And so there you go. Sean says, if there was one game you could see brought back to life on Xbox in Game Pass, what would it be? This is an easy one for me. Easy one. So take the mechanics of Age of Empires 2, the controller scheme, drop them on to Command and Conquer Red Alert 2, put that into Game Pass. Oh man, RA2 on a console like that with that control scheme, I it would be it would be the perfect title for me, and I would sink all the times into it. Absolutely all the time into it. So uh, last question of the week comes from Patrick F. And he says, Brad, what are your 2025 goals that are not tech related? Not tech related. Good question, I guess. Yeah, not I guess. That's a good good question for me. So I always, an ongoing goal, I always try to read two books every year. I read two books last year. Um, gosh, one of them was about stocks and bonds, the big bond. Uh, the Bond Baron, I think is what it was called. And then there was another engineering book that I read. Um, ooh, let's see. Two, my, uh, the goals for this year are, one is to, so for Christmas, this all ties in. Health is a big one. I guess I'm, I'm stuttering around. It's Health is a big one, right? So every year I always try to do the Apple Watch goals. If you have an Apple Watch, or I think some of the other devices do this, it sets a monthly goal and you're supposed to try to get that goal and then you get a little award. You know, they're completely meaningless awards and nothing happens if you get them other than a cool little animation. However, they're they're based on your habits. So my goal every year is to get all 12 months of the Apple Fitness Awards and that way I try to keep a certain level of health. Uh, my wife for Christmas also got me a standing desk because long time listeners and by long time I mean since like what, December? No, I also have a treadmill right off screen here. So there's definitely more health-related stuff to getting a certain amount of standing hours every day, so I'm not always sitting. Um, standing desks aren't for everybody, and candidly, they're not even, I didn't even think it was for me. I've got it up and running now, and, and so one of the problems, which I will I will detail here briefly, is with standing desks, so, right, it goes up. I'm 6'2", so I keep that desk pretty high when I'm standing to be comfortable at it, is when you put that much mass up in the air, when the, the fixture points are all down on the ground, you get wobble right? The, the screens like you're typing and they wobble. If you have a low center of gravity, things don't wobble as much, but when you do that, it wobbles. So what I've bought is if you go up, if you go on Amazon or Google or whatever and see and, and Google CNC rails. So for a, a CNC machine, right? The, uh, the, the cutting head usually translates across the, the cutting medium or cutting whatever in, in you know, uh, X and Y axes, right? That's how it moves around. So what I bought, because I need to attach this desk to the wall to stop the wobble, is just one singular rail that is designed with the ball bearing. So then what I'm gonna do is attach the, what is effectively a thing you attach typically to the cutting head to my desk, and then attach the rail to the stud in the wall, assuming I can find it, and then it will be fixed to the wall, but it can still then move up and down without being, you know, some, requiring some major surgery. So it should be really helpful with that. So that's a really long way to say I want to read two books again, because that's my kind of baseline. But you want to say your real goal should be to read three, but like two, like I typically read books on vacation and, and during certain breaks. And so two just kind of works out in that way. That the problem is the way my brain works is because I'm competitive. If I chose three, then I would intentionally try to choose smaller books. And so I wouldn't read, I would read three books, but they would be less in length. So when I don't do only do two, I don't worry about length 
Um, I try to pick books that I think I'd be interested in and then go from there and continue the health stuff. Um, I, I always try to venture more outside of my own gaming sort of ecosystem, right? Because I love to play Call of Duty. I love per person shooters. So I always try to pick like one or two games. Like the last game that I played that was outside my typical uh, wheelhouse would be Vampire Survivors. And I found out I love that game. That game was brilliant and I still play it on occasion. And so typically try to find a number of games outside of that. Other than that, you know, spend more time with the family, less time on the phone, that sort of stuff. Out, get outside, get fresh air, um, go hiking. Those are all, I don't know if they're specific, specific, that's a cool word, uh, specific <laughs> action items are tied to that. It's a very corporate -y way to look at it. But, um, you know, I turned 40 this year. So I think just keeping the knees from disintegrating under me is also a goal for the year. There you go. Like I said, friends, the shorter podcast this week just because of the nature of the week. But hopefully everybody had a wonderful 2024. Hopefully you've had a wonderful first three days of 2025. And as always, my friends, make sure to keep it subscribed here because only BS on this podcast is me.